Getting a German short hair pointer. It's a very, very exciting time, but have you thought about where they should be sleeping at night? Well, we have the video for you. Welcome back to the Fenrir German Short Hair Pointer Show. My name's Joe and I'm a certified canine leader here at FenrirCanineLeaders.com. We are dedicated to helping you learn everything you could possibly want to know about the German Short Hair Pointer and then how to become a high level canine leader so you can raise your very own. So if you're new here, don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell so you never miss a future upload. Getting a German Short Hair Pointer is a very, very exciting time. However, something you should definitely be considering is where they're going to be sleeping at night. So today we're going to be tuning into a webinar that Canine Behaviour and founder of fenrirk 9 Will has recorded all about where your puppy should be sleeping at night. So over to you, Will. So then let's dive back into another quick fire webinar. And today I want to answer the question of where should a puppy sleep when they first come home to their new owner's house? Now, this is one of those questions that I get asked a lot from my own clients, and maybe you're considering working in the field of a trainer or a behaviorist, and if so, your clients are going to be asking you this question a lot as well. The problem, like with most things in the dog training world, is that it can be very diversive, and some people might swear by one way, and some people might swear by another. At Fenrir, we take a very balanced approach and look at all different methods and methodologies for their individual merit, and we marry the right approach up to the right person. And I think that's what's the important takeaway of today's webinar when we're answering the question of where should a dog sleep. When I discuss this with my clients, again, I think it's very bespoke. I always, always encourage people to be very proactive when they're getting a dog. It shouldn't be done emotionally. It shouldn't be done on a whim. It should be considered carefully and then it should be planned for. Part of the planning is to sit down with other people in the household and come up with rules, boundaries and expectations. One of those rules, boundaries and expectations needs to be where is the puppy or the dog going to sleep during the day for its naps and then where is it going to sleep at night my advice is to always come up with the answer to that question and then start from day one where possible now there is an exception to that rule that i'm going to talk about later on in this little quick fire webinar but even if your answer to that question was, well, I'd like my dog when they're older to be able to have free roam. Maybe you're interested in getting a garden dog, so you want them to be able to wander around at night and check everything's going okay. Well, for me, I really think it's important that if that's the case, to start really small and then build out the circles of independence. What I mean by that is say, worst case scenario, you needed to shut your dog away, keep them out of the way. You've got friends over that are scared of dogs, for example, or something's going on and you just need to get them out of the way and get them to sleep there for a minute where would that be many people that's the kitchen the utility uh, a crate in a quiet place well, I think that that's where you should start. Start there, and then as your dog gets older, as toilet training gets to established and you start to have success there, as you can start to trust them to not chew and destroy your house, maybe you can leave them in a crate, but with a crate door open in a room, and that room's closed off. So they've got access to that room, they can come in and out of their crate for a little bit more freedom. You can test that if that goes well, then maybe they can have the hallway. Then maybe they can have the hallway and the living room. Maybe they can then have all of downstairs and then after so many months so as that trust builds you start small and then slowly you build it up but if anything ever happens worst case scenario it then becomes much easier to pull that back if you start really wide it's then incredibly challenging to be able to get that into a smaller area for whatever reason most people think well I'll never need to go down to a smaller area I promise you there may be times when you need to the main one is if your dog ever becomes ill or poorly and they have to go to a vet where they have an overnight stay. They will be cut, put in a crate or a cage or a small kennel whilst they're there. A dog that is comfortable and being in a small confined area will find that trip much more bearable and much more pleasant than a dog that isn't used to it, hasn't had any of that in its life, will then become much more emotional and it can become a very, very negative scenario where hopefully if they need to go for an operation, you can make it as pleasant as possible. So my advice is to always start small and then if you want to give them more freedom, you can. If not, well, then they're there straight away. That then naturally comes on to the question of crate training and I'm not going to discuss the pros and cons of crate training. Again, this is one of them things we could do hours and hours um, of lecturing and webinars alone on the crate training topic. 
to give you a very, very quick summary, I think they're fantastic. And I think every dog owner should crate train their dogs. If for the only reason being, the reason that I just mentioned there about if your dog needs to go to a vet, you can travel in the car with them much easier and safer in a crate. And when they go somewhere, they can be crated and be kept safe. It's also fantastic for toilet training and it's fantastic for giving rules, boundaries and expectations and stopping setting them up for failure by giving them too much access, then them chewing things and you getting frustrated and telling them off. If they were crate trained, they'd be able to go into a crate where it's a nice, safe, pleasant, secure area where they can learn that it's a positive, nice place for them to calm down. It's their own little space. Crates are amazing. So my advice, again, best case scenario is that a dog should sleep in a crate at night. That's the small circle. And then in the future, as toilet training and the chewing phases you come out of, you can then start to give them more and more freedom as they get older. That's my advice. Now, I did say that towards the end of the webinar, I'll give a bit of a caveat to that. If you live in an area, maybe you live in a flat or an apartment or in a terraced house where you're attached to people and you've got very close neighbors, those first few nights can be very challenging, especially if you are going down the crate route. If you crate training at night, I give people, talk about it a lot in my perfect puppy course but I kind of say that there's two routes that you can take there's the tough love approach and there's the nicey nicey softy softy approach the tough love approach is that inner circle we just talked about for me for example when we in the old house where we had if anybody followed our training channel when I had my Connie Corso puppy Mabel we had an attached house and we had neighbors and as a good neighbor I didn't want to keep them up all night with a dog crying and barking so I went for the softy softy approach for my neighbor's benefit more than anything and that works well it just takes much longer now we've moved out to our farm we have no neighbors so i would always go for the tough love approach because it's much quicker much more efficient gets the job done instills good rules boundaries and expectations very early on and lets them know that crying barking obnoxious behavior doesn't get them the desired outcome that they want there's a lot of nice positives wrapped up even if it can be very difficult to listen to so that's the tough love approach the nicey nicey approach is that you still put them in a crate but you put them next to your bed that way the dog can hear you they can see you ideally they can smell you you can reach down and put your fingers through the crate but they still get the concept of understanding that barking crying whining isn't going to get them out of the crate but you are there to settle them down and ideally get to sleep what will happen is they might cry and bark a little bit but it'll be nowhere near if they were in a room on their own somewhere else in the house that way you can get them through those first few nights without driving your neighbors up the wall which is good nice people i do think it's always ideal that we want to take that into account with our neighbors and just be good people basically then what you can do is they go from the side of the bed you can put the crate down at the end of the bed a few more nights there if that goes well you can then move the crate to the doorway leave the door to your bedroom wide open put the crate nicely in the doorway so they're kind of halfway into the hall but halfway in the room they can still still hear you see you smell you and then that goes well for a few nights. You move them out onto the landing, but keep your door open. Then you can keep your door half closed, move them a bit further. And you get the idea bit by bit over the weeks. If they have probably two or three solid nights where it goes well, move them a bit further. And over the space of a couple of weeks, a month, two months, you can slowly but surely move them to the point where you've got them into that small circle. Now, the tough love approach will achieve that in usually a couple of days. The softy softy approach can take a couple of weeks to a uh, couple of months sometimes but again i'm not here to say that there is one approach that's right for everybody any dog trainer that says that i think is a red flag immediately again a balanced trainer a balanced canine behaviorist is one that is educated and understands multiple different theories methodologies different breeds and different requirements for different types of dog in different homesteads with different families and different people all those different variables mean that oftentimes there is different methods that will work some faster some quicker some might be a bit more tough love some might be a bit more softy softy but the right people with the right dog all built off that principle of calm consistently leadership you will get through those first few nights and it is always the thing that people find most challenging they're so excited to get a new puppy this bundle of cuteness and they bring it home and they've had it all day on that first day and you've done a bit of training and you've had a bit of success and toilet training's going well and then nighttime comes 
that first night they squeal and bark all night and then it starts to devolve very quickly into what I call the puppy blues which again I think the puppy blues is something that is never talked about and I do a whole module on puppy blues just because of how challenging puppies can be so there we go that's my opinion on where puppies should sleep um, I hope you found it useful I hope this webinar we, I try not to drag them out because I can talk for hours on these topics I want them to be short sharp snappy packed full of value and as helpful as possible to start you on your journey to to becoming a calm, consistent leader that has perfect canine companions. And I can't wait to see you on the next one of these quickfire webinars. There you have it, guys. Some really useful information from Will there, all about where your puppy should sleep at night. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. If so, get involved in the comments down below as we would love to hear from you. Don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell as we have two dedicated videos coming in every single week. So I can't wait to see you in the next episode of the Fenrir German Shorthead Pointer Show.